Good morning. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Scripture reading today is taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers to the world to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we pause for a moment of prayer? Eternal God, We pray this morning that you gather our thoughts, calm our spirits and our minds. May we listen to your word this morning with our head, with our heart, with our emotions, and with our hands. In Jesus' name, Amen. The Lord be with you. The two verses that our dear sister Gretling read to us just now deal with the practical aspects of Christian living. That we should not only have the right creed, but also the right deeds. Correct theology should lead to correct behavior in society. The Apostle James tells us that faith without action is dead. In Peter, verse 12, the verse that was read to us, the Apostle Peter calls on Christians during his time to live in such a manner that the majority pagans in his society, in their society, may see their good works and glorify God in heaven. In the earlier verse, in verse 11, Peter reminded his audience that they were viewed by the society in which they are in as aliens and strangers. In other words, pendatang. Very familiar word. In the midst of a very hostile Christian environment. And I think so, we live in our local context today. Not very much different. There's a lot of animosity against Christians and there's a lot of Christian bashing the last being at the seminar in UITM. So you find that we can relate to this passage, pendatang, aliens, strangers. However, the the Apostle Peter, in using these two words, aliens and strangers, underscore the dual character of the Christian conduct namely our natural our relationship with our friends and neighbors that horizontal relationship and our vertical relationship with God and all the responsibilities that these two relationships entail in verse 12 peter calls us christians to live good lives or to live godly life what exactly is good life, godly life, good deeds. What is the role of the church in the society she is situated? Is it evangelism, saving souls, or bringing social justice, helping the poor and the marginalized? Billy Graham, the great evangelist of our century, says that evangelism and the salvation of souls is the vital mission of the church. At the 
at the other end of the spectrum, we have Jose Merinda. Jose Merinda is a liberationist theologian. And you find plenty of them in South America. And he said this, God is knowable exclusively in the cry of the poor. Should the church then, today, immerse itself solely in evangelism and the business of saving souls? Or should the church be involved in structural social reforms, political reforms, and fight for justice for the poor and the marginalized? To find a meaningful and a balanced role of the church and for us to stay relevant in today's context and even in this local context, we need to go back to the basics. To ask ourselves, what is the gospel? What does salvation mean to us? Is it more biblical for us to say that the gospel is good news for the forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ's death on the cross? Or the gospel is good news of the kingdom of God which the Old Testament prophets foresaw in the person of Jesus Christ, creating a realistic society today. Christians are divided. We have various and diverse convictions to these two questions. From the very evangelical that is stressing vertical relationship with God, which emphasizes saving of souls, to the liberationist position, the horizontal position in our relationship with men, where salvation is primarily realized in the revolutionary overthrow of imperialistic capitalism, so that the poor may have equal share in the country's wealth. The key to these questions, I would say, for the church today is not to dwell at these two extremes but to listen to the voice of the prophets in the Old Testament to listen, to see the works the deeds of Jesus Christ in the New Testament the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news, is undeniable at least to all of us to the Christian community but to limit that this good news is only the spiritual aspect of forgiveness of sin and a ticket to heaven. I think that is great injustice in the interpretation of scriptures. Jesus died on the cross to set man free from sin and all that sin entails. He brings liberty to the captives and freedom and sets the, the prisoners free. Free from spiritual, societal and economic bondages that enslave society since the day Adam was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. At his birth, Jesus broke into human history, ushering in the kingdom of God a kingdom in which the Old Testament prophets foresaw and foretold. One in which they foresaw relationships between man and God, man and man, man and nature fully restored. And this was the messianic hope of the prophets of old. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 31 verse, 1, verse 31 to 34, shows that the right relationship with God is the center of this messianic hope that God will remember our sins no more. Verse 34, <clears throat> let me just read 34. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. 
the prophets of old foresaw a restored relationship between God and man. Equally important is that ringing declaration found that the Messiah will also restore relationship with man and his neighbor, with man and man. And in Isaiah 2.4, the prophet says, In the last days, i.e. Messianic times, the times where Christ reigns, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. The parallel passage in Micah 4.4 4, foresaw a productive, just economic order. <clears throat> they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees and no one shall make them afraid. No more economic exploitation. Isaiah 42 verses 1 to 4 further expands it to include not just individual hearts and individual relationships with a few neighbours, but that the whole social order will be transformed. 42 verse 1, I'll read part of it. Isaiah 42 verse 1. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Verse 4, he will not falter or discourage till he establishes justice on earth. This is the messianic hope of the Old Testament Christian. In short, there will be no more economic exploitation, be it powerful nations dictating unfair trade practices to underdeveloped nations, or multinationals exploiting their migrant workers. This, of course, will bring much hope to many migrant workers, including those within our shores and within even our church community. No more will we see the current situation where 20% of the world's population consumes 80% of the world's resources. Everything in the prophecy of the Old Testament prophets, everything will be on a level playing field. And in their soaring messianic vision, the prophets even dare to dream of harmony, of peaceful coexistence between man and the animal world. In Isaiah 11, verses 8 and 9, the, prof the prophet wrote, The infant will play near the hole of a cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The prophets have long thought that God is specially concerned for the poor, the weak, the needy, the marginalized. And therefore, it is hardly surprising that justice for the poor and caring for the needy were central themes in the vision of a new messianic kingdom, which the prophets foresaw and foretold centuries ago. Isaiah 11 verse 4 says, With righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Now, the Israelite society, at the time of all these prophecies, at the time where the prophets make all these prophecies, was far from ideal. It may be worse than what we are having here now. Kings, leaders, misrule and abuse their authority and position. No different from the situation we have today in our country. There is no social or economic justice. The upper class of society live in obscene luxury, and we see it here. People who claim to be just housewives flying in private executive jets, and that's obscene. While the common folks are living in a jet poverty, 
oftentimes exploited by the rich and the powerful. Religiously, the Israelite nation has gone after all other gods that can be found in their pagan society. Instead of following and going after the God who brought them out of Egypt and into the promised land. And so for all their depravity, God threw the people of Israel into Babylonian captivity. Yet, in the midst of their political and economic oppression, idolatry and captivity in Babylon, the prophets look to the future Messianic times when God will bring transformed relationships between himself and man, and man and man and man with nature. This was the shalom, the peace that the prophets envisioned, the wholeness between man, neighbor, and nature when the Messiah comes. In the New Testament, the early church declared that Jesus is the fulfillment of all these breathtaking prophecies that was found in the Old Testament. The angelic proclamation on the first Christmas night in Luke 2.14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, shalom, to man on whom his favor dwells. This shalom draws reference to the shalom that the prophets declared centuries ago. It was significant that the breaking news of the coming of the kingdom of God on earth and with all its implications of salvation, peace and justice in all spheres of life was given to a group of shepherds who were themselves despised and shunned by their own countrymen because they were ritually unclean. Hence, you find that the first Christmas message, that it is a clear message that the weak, the poor, the marginalized will be Jesus' priority. And our relationship with them and our treatment of them will be noticed on God's radar screen. Jesus did not choose to break into human history amongst the rich and the famous, but he rather chose to be born in a stable and experience the life of a refugee when he was a child. Matthew 2.20 tells us that the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus, by his life, constantly associated with those on the margins of society. The poor flocked to him, and he fed and healed the needy and the sick. You and I as individual Christians, and we as a church, Malacca Wesley, need to reflect afresh the ministry and the ministry of the church in an environment where there are lots of people crying out for emotional, spiritual, and material support. And how we respond to these non-Christians so that, as Peter says, they may see your godly deeds or your good deeds. Not only see, that our God in heaven may be glorified. That the non-believers in our society may see God in God through our actions and hopefully come to know him. Jesus' ministry on earth can be summarized basically into three words. Teaching, preaching, healing. Matthew 9.35 Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in the synagogues preaching the gospel to the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. 
Jesus ministered to whole persons, sick bodies, broken spirits, disrupted relationships with God, all received his healing touch. Jesus modeled what he taught. He not only announced the arrival of the Messianic era of shalom and justice to the poor and oppressed, he also fed the hungry and welcomed the socially ostracized into his new community of friends. The salvation that we talk about, the gospel that we receive, is good news because it is clearly holistic body, soul, and spirit. It ministers to all areas. Yes, our salvation brings forgiveness of sin and inner sanctification by the power of the Spirit. But it challenges you and I as individual Christians and as a church to change social order by our behavior and our actions. The gospel impacts the soul and body, individual and society. Christians, you and I, and the church, we need to properly communicate the good news of Jesus Christ by word, by deed. Hence, you find that the Bible is very clear, both in the new and in the old, that it gives support to Peter's call for Christians to do good works. Yes, preach the gospel, save souls. But more than that, we need to show good deeds that people's souls can be saved. And therefore, it's crystal clear that social justice and caring for the poor and marginalized occupy center stage, both in the New and the Old Testament. God's heart is always with the widows and the fatherless. And again, you and I as individual Christians and as a local church, if we are truly after God's own heart, we cannot run away from this responsibility, this call from Peter, verse 12. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, 8 to 10, very common verse, reminds us that it is by grace through faith that we are saved, not by works. You cannot work for your salvation, but... Salvation is proven by a life of good works. Verse 10 tells us, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Peter, in the same sentiment, stretched the thought a little bit further by saying that such good works in the midst of an unbelieving society can result in unbelievers glorifying God. But how you and I as individual Christians and as a church, how do we begin? Where do we begin? And I want to propose at, the end, at this part of the sermon some practical views. Uh, practical things that we can do as individuals and Christians and, and as a church. I give you the so-called the theological basis. Okay, let me say first of all <coughs> that good works can be done individually. A stand-alone action. Or it can be done corporately as a local church. Good works can take the form of spiritual and emotional support to physical and material help for the needy. And there is no fixed and fast rules how we can help in extending aid, help, and all this will depend on the situation. Aid can come in the form of relief in times of natural disaster, we can provide food, clothing, shelter, water, whatever it is. In times of natural disasters like floods, tsunami, major landslides, earthquakes, fire, we can respond when natural disasters strike. And this type of aid 
will require continuous giving if the disaster prolongs, as it does not empower the recipient to care for his future needs, as seen in refugee camps in war-torn countries. We just give. They're hungry, we give them one meal. Hungry evening, we give them the dinner. Next morning, we give them the breakfast. But that helps people to survive and continue to live with immediate aid. Another type of aid that you and I can give, and I feel Christians are involved, individual and through organizations, is to provide individuals and communities with appropriate tools, skills, knowledge, so that they can care for themselves in the future. Providing them with microfinancing to start small businesses, or helping them to dig wells, or constructing better irrigation system so that their farms can produce, can be more productive, or even helping their children, giving their children a proper education. And we see this being done through organizations like Asian Outreach, Malaysian Care, Open Doors, World Vision, just to name a few. This type of aid will help people to be self-sufficient economically, whereas the earlier aid will only prevent starvation and death. There's a third and a very important way in which we can help the needy, and that is Maybe for some people, participation in politics can help to bring about structural change to create a fairer society by creating greater freedom, democracy, economic justice, and environmental sustainability. And I think we see a new crop of politicians in our local context who have realized and have answered that call. The church cannot be silent when social injustice and exploitation of the poor is rampant in society. We need to have more people like the late Irene Fernandez who gave her life for migrant workers. She was threatened with all sorts of funny laws that only Malaysia has. And she survived. Christians must involve themselves in the legislature and public life to bring about fairer laws and practices in the public domain. The church cannot separate itself from politics. There is no such thing called separation of state and church. Because the church must speak up against social evil and social injustice. And social evil and social injustice has its roots in corrupt politicians with their corrupt practices in a corrupt system. And therefore, the church must be involved. Of course, maybe lawyers are better at this. Coming back in our local context, <coughs> English-speaking churches in Malaysia are mostly middle class or upper middle class, Wesley Mlaka included. We have been too long maintaining our status quo by coming to church every week and then going home, oftentimes oblivious to the needs around us. We need a paradigm shift to practice our faith outside the church instead of just within the church compound. Their needs around us are tremendous. Migrant workers, people who are stuck in the low-income poverty cycle, those with physical abilities, the sick, and those facing life-threatening diseases, the elderly, and particularly those who do not have relatives to care for them. The list goes on. What is our response as individuals and as a church? Let me be very realistic at this point. I'm not suggesting that we are going and get involved and, uh, and uplift and solve all the social evil in this world, or in Malacca, or even within our church compound. 
The job is just too big for individuals or even as a corporate body as a church. It is an impossible task because the mission is too big for any organization. We recognize that as a church, Wesley Mlaka, we do not have all the expertise, manpower, money, time or energy. Furthermore, we have our own families to take care. We have our jobs. And both of these are our primary calling. Therefore, you take all these things into consideration. We have to realistically admit that we have very little time, we have very little money, we have very little expertise to launch into any large-scale work to do good deeds, especially amongst the pagan society we are in. But that does not excuse the church and you and I as Christians for not doing anything. We are reminded that we are saved to do good works. And James solemnly reminds us, faith without action is dead. A faith that is not reflected in our behavior in, in society, at home, or our place of work is not genuine faith. It is at best piety, something akin to the Pharisees' religion which Jesus strongly condemns. Going to church on Sunday alone is not faith or trust in God. It is the, just the misplaced idea of buying spiritual insurance without paying any premium. And therefore, it doesn't give any coverage on Judgment Day. Matthew 25. 31 to 46. I will just read from 35 because these verses give us some sobering thoughts, especially to us who are economically well-off Christians. Jesus said, eh? For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty <coughs> and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you come to me. Then the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visited you? The king will answer, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brother, you did it to me. It is said that the poor needs the rich to live. And the rich needs the poor to go to heaven. Think about that. I think whoever wrote that must have got this. <coughs> so you find that do we must the poor needs us we acknowledge that we cannot do a lot of things. But Peter tells us good needs we need to do because that's the only way non-believers can get a glimpse of the God we profess. Unbelievers are not coming to church to find out who this God is. Or neither are they going to read a book called the Bible, which anyway they don't believe. We are their Bibles as we mingle with them in the marketplace. Our behavior our value system will show forth to them. And hence, that's why Peter calls us to do good deeds. <clears throat> now, I'm going to time running short. So I'm going to propose something that we all can do if you want to respond to Peter's verse in verse 12 take small steps do small things but must have passion and compassion for what you plan to do I'm going to propose that if you, I know some of us are very involved in some work but if you haven't I'm going to propose that you look around us 
be it within the church compound or outside the church compound or further. Look for someone, just one person whom you think so in need. Maybe a guy in hospital that needs visit, a single mother that needs some emotional support, an old lady or old man who maybe needs us to visit, a child from a deprived home, failing every test in school. Maybe you want to help to give a bit of tuition. You don't know what to do, think of Salvation Army or something like that. I'm going to propose that you do just choose one, focus on one. And don't have grand plans to say that you're going to spend three hours a day with that person. Be realistic. Commit yourself maybe to half an hour a week to visit the person. If that is too much, never mind. Half an hour every two weeks. Or visit a sick person once a month. Whatever the frequency may be, depending your own situation, do that. Look around. And if we can do that, 200 of us, we would have ministered to 200 people. And that is a great start. Though earlier I say, take small steps, start small. Yeah, we start small, but as a corporate people, we have reached out to 200 people. Some of us, we find that we are not being practical. We are very ambitious. We say, yeah, I must visit the sick, so I must visit everybody in General Hospital or in Pantai Hospital. Don't try that. Don't even try to plan to visit every sick person in this church, because there are plenty. You can't do that. You only do that when you become Superman. Okay? Before you become Superman, just start small. And I think so, that will be a great thing in answer to Peter's call for us to do good deeds that non-Christians may see us how are we performing as a church well as a church I think so not too bad huh? we are greatly involved deeply involved in migrant ministry we have the memories as a church we have the Nepalis there are some of, many of us are very involved in that. There are some of us are very involved in helping the poor through the tuition center, through the daycare. There are others who have helped and are still helping those who are physically handicapped, challenged through Wings Malacca. And Wings Malacca was set up largely because of Wesley Malacca. So in some sense, we have reached out as a church to the community around us. And lately, many of us are involved, many of you rather, have been involved in setting up this old folks' home, Emmanuel Life Spring. So you find that as a church, yeah, we have done something. Maybe you can give yourself a pat on the shoulder. You did something. But as all good school teachers will tell you, there is still room for improvement. And I think so, we need to do that. There's still room for improvement. Okay, I'll close. Now, Methodism plays great emphasis on social holiness or outward holiness. I think the second last one there. Simply means a holiness that is visible through our life, through our actions. Holiness is not a halo around our head or as misunderstood in the first century by the ascetics where they forsook the world and go into the desert or later on as seen in monasticism where people separate their world, their, themselves from the world to live in the monasteries. A holy man or a holy woman of God is one who lives by the precepts and commands of God in relationship not just to God but also to society at large. Our holiness, our spirituality is not defined by separation from the world 
but by impacting the world with godly deeds and goodly deeds, and by our behavior and actions. And this is most profoundly seen in our treatment of the poor, the needy, and the marginalized. And I think so that we can all begin consciously by setting a little bit of time, as I propose, to reach out to somebody who are in need. Well, throughout this sermon, I have placed great emphasis on the materially poor. So also the scriptures. There are also lots of many wealthy people who are emotionally, socially, and spiritually poor. Zacchaeus was a wealthy man, but socially and spiritually he was bankrupt before his encounter with Jesus. So also was the rich young ruler who came to see Jesus. Rich people also face sicknesses. They also sometimes face terminal illness. They also need the touch of God and the comfort of scriptures. So it's my prayer, my hope, as I speak to you, I speak to myself also, that in small ways, we may respond to 1 Peter 2.12 to do our little bit that hopefully non-believers may see God in us, may see the Bible or rather read the Bible in us and hopefully they may be drawn into the kingdom of God. Shall we pray? Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we want to pray, Lord, that you will help us to listen to your word and not only to listen, to take heed and to act upon it as the Apostle Peter reminds us. Lord, we thank you for this hour of worship in Jesus' name. Amen.